Hi guys, and welcome to my presentation on skin rashes. My name is Natasha, I'm one of the interns at Nepean Hospital. Today in this presentation I'll be covering a few things, starting with common rashes, then um, some rashes that aren't that common but good to know for med school, and finally some paediatric exanthema. If you've already done paediatrics and that's not relevant to you, please feel free to skip that part. Unfortunately, I could not include skin cancers, pre-malignant skin conditions, or acne. Before I begin the cases, um, some good resources for dermatology as well as my sources for this presentation include Dermnet, um, which is where I've got all the pictures for my presentation, as well as Toronto Notes, for more of a broad understanding. Okay, case one. Billy is a four-year-old girl who was brought in by her mother. Her mother is concerned that she's always scratching her arms and legs. Billy attends childcare and her mother is concerned that it may be scabies. And Billy is otherwise well and progressing well in her develop developmental milestones. As you can see from the picture, um, the distribution of the rash is mostly on her extensor surfaces. And you might be able to see evidence of excoriation. You explain to Billy's mother that this is a common condition that affects 15 to 20 percent of children that's caused by an inflammatory response. Billy's mother is concerned that, if it, that Billy will develop scarring and be bullied at school. She would like to know how to cure this. So think about what the diagnosis could be and, and in the bottom of this slide I've included this rash at different aged children to kind of give you more of a clue. Um, so if you said atopic dermatitis or eczema, good job. Some of the features that kind of pointed us towards this diagnosis is the age of the child um, and the distribution of the rash. So in a toddler aged person, the eczema is usually on the extensor surfaces, as you can see in the second picture. Um, in babies, it's generally on the face and the neck. And then in older children, school aged children, you're the usually on the flexor surfaces, um, as you can see in the third picture. So um, other features that weren't included in this vignette that might point you towards um, a diagnosis of eczema would be uh, a, hist a family history of atopy or a personal history of atopy. And of course the itching is a big giveaway. So moving on to management options, of course first line is always reducing uh, exposure to triggers if there are any, not everyone has some. Um, then regular emollients and intermittently topical steroids. If this fails to work, then topical calcineurin inhibitors like primecrolimus can be used, as well as antibiotics for secondary bacterial infections, antihistamines for the rash, um, phototherapy and oral corticosteroids. And then for long-standing and severe eczema, you might consider methotrexate cyclosporin as a thioprine. But obviously you want to avoid this in children who are still growing, if you can. Moving on to case two. Yi is a 24-year-old new grad nurse working at Nepean Hospital. She is concerned because in the last few weeks since she started working, um, applying hand sanitizer has caused extreme stinging and her hands are starting to look red and they're peeling. Yi doesn't want this to affect her new job. What's the diagnosis? So um, if you said contact irritant dermatitis, good job. Um, some of the features that make you consider, th consider this is um, use a nurse, she's going to be washing her hands a lot, using lots of chemicals that maybe she hasn't used before. Um, and from the picture you can see that it's in the distribution of the hands where you usually get contact with these kind of chemicals. Um, moving on to the management options, identifying a possible substance is the first thing that you would do and try and avoid exposure to that. Say it's a particular hand sanitizer or a particular brand of wipe or gloves that triggers your reaction. You're going to avoid that one. Um, and then wearing gloves where, where possible, moisturizing, using topical steroids, and then if there's a secondary infection, using antibiotics. Something interesting I learned from my mandatory training in internship is that you're meant to moisturize your hands three times per eight hour shift. 
Okay, moving on to case three. 21 year old Felicia attends her GP in a panic. She has red spots all over her body, specifically on her back. Her friends are refusing to see her because they have never had chickenpox. She's not itchy and hasn't come into contact with anyone with any rashes. A couple of weeks ago, she noticed a two centimeter scaly patch on her leg, but did not think it was important. Although she's very distressed, she thinks, you, she thinks it's kind of funny that uh, the rash looks a bit like a Christmas tree on her back. So what is this diagnosis? So this one is pityriasis rosea. So some of the features that point you towards this diagnosis is the herald patch, the two centimeter scaly patch that she notices a couple of weeks before the main rash and this classic Christmas tree pattern, um, specifically on the back. Um, things that point you away from this uh, differential diagnosis of chicken pox is that she's not itchy at all. Um, from what you can see in this picture, the rash looks pretty uniform throughout her body. Um, and the lack of contact. Um, so it's pretty much supportive management for pityriasis, so um, avoiding soap and washing with plain water, moisturising and um, cautious exposure, exposure to sunlight, so not burning. Okay, moving right along. Jakob is a 39-year-old man who visits his GP because of a scaly rash he has on his elbows and lower back. Please excuse that the picture doesn't quite match that description. He says that his mother had a similar rash, but they're estranged, so he doesn't know much about it. Jakob smokes 15 cigarettes a day and drinks a bottle of wine over two days. He's on metformin and corindacryl. He's self-conscious about his weight and has been advised to lose weight by his husband. What is the diagnosis? This one's kind of one of those spot diagnoses you notice from the picture, that scaly rash. It is psoriasis. Um, psoriasis can present in a number of different ways. If you open the DermNet page on psoriasis, there's like five different types. Um, so I've just gone for a general overview of psoriasis. And it's classically this scaly, um, pearly looking rash on the extensive surfaces of the body. Um, some things that kind of make you think that it's psoriasis is um, Jakob is overweight, he's a pre or he's diabetic or pre-diabetic, he's smoking and he drinks a fair bit of alcohol. In terms of management options, in general education about the skin condition and the exacerbating and relieving factors. So smoking cessation, avoiding excessive alcohol, maintaining an optimal weight. Then there's topical therapies, so emollients and coal tar preparations, diethrenol, salicylic acid and vitamin D analogs, topical corticosteroids, um, betamethasone and calcitriol um, ointments, and then calcineurin inhibitors. Phototherapy is also an option, and then if you're getting to moderate to severe disease, you can think about systemic therapy like methotrexate, salphosporin, acetretin. Um, and finally, the biologics, which I haven't gone into at all because that's a whole topic on its own. Uh, but if you are interested, do have a look. So that would include examples of inf like infliximab. Okay, moving on to case five. Anjali is a 76-year-old who lives at an aged care facility that you visit. She has a chronic skin condition that erupts with itchy, tense sub-epidermal bullae on her medial thighs, groin and axilla. It started when she was in her 60s. When it first started, you investigated it with a skin biopsy and had immunofluorescence performed, which showed linear deposition of IgG and C3 along the basement membrane. What is the diagnosis? If you said bullous pemphigoid, good job. Um, some of the features that point us towards this diagnosis is the older age of this patient, um, the fact that it is that the rash is this tense sub-epidermal bulla that look like this, um, and the distribution being on like the medial thighs of growing the axilla, those areas where there are skin folds. 
and they're also usually quite itchy and uncomfortable. Um, one kind of silly way to remember Fullus pemphigoid versus Pemphigus vulgaris is that Pemphigus could happen to us, whereas Pemphigoid happens to older people. <laughs> it's a bit silly. Okay, in terms of management for um, Pemphigoid is ultrapotent topical steroids. If the rash is less than 10% of the body surface area, then moderate potency topical steroids and emollients. Uh, if it's greater than 10, obviously, then systemic steroids for a long duration, um, which is associated with all the systemic steroid side effects, which I encourage you to look up. Um, then tetracycline antibiotics um, to ease with the inflammation, so to help with the inflammation. Um, and then, of course, antibiotics for secondary bacterial infections and pain relief. Case 6. Sorry, I should have had a warning before this slide. This is quite an unpleasant rush to look at. Pierre is a 43-year-old man who presents to his GP um, with painful, blistering, non-pruritic rash. We perform a biopsy adjacent to one of the lesions and it shows rounded up and separated keratinocytes. Direct immunofluorescence shows IgG and C3 deposition intraepidermally. What is the diagnosis? So I haven't given you much um, in terms of a vignette for this case. Um, so that makes it quite difficult for you. Um, I guess I can say it's similar. It has a similar name to the last case we covered. Um, and it's extremely rare. So it is full of Pardon, now I'm getting confused. It's Pemphigus vulgaris. Um, so I guess typically looks like this image. This is quite a severe case. Uh, if you saw this in your GP, you wouldn't want to be handling it by yourself. You'd be, of course, referring to a dermatologist. Um, okay, yep. Moving on to the management. Um, we have three aims to decrease blister formation prevent infections and promote healing of the existing blisters. So the first line would be systemic corticosteroids, which is not a cure but decreases disease activity um, and improves the patient's quality of life. In fact, I was reading that the mortality rate of Pemphigus vulgaris has decreased massively since the uh, introduction of systemic corticosteroids as a treatment option. Some off-label medications that are used include azathioprine, mifepristone, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab. But of course, um, don't talk about these ones in, in any exams. It's just a point of interest. Okay, case seven. Hassan is a four-year-old boy who has recently migrated to Australia with his family with fleeing conflict overseas. Hassan and his family were living in a refugee camp prior to being granted refugee status in Australia. We are working in a refugee health center and see Hassan and his family for their checkups. We notice that Hassan and his siblings are itching themselves a lot during the consult. We use your dermatoscope to examine his rash and see burrows. And um, this picture on the right is what you would see if you looked under a microscope. So what is the diagnosis here? If you said scabies, you're right. Um, some features of this vignette that point towards scabies include uh, possibly lower socioeconomic status, coming from a refugee camp, maybe living in a crowded situation. We don't know, of course, um, that's not mentioned in the vignette. Um, those are the kind of things that suggest scabies. However, anyone can get scabies if they come into contact with it. So some of the management options, so, well, the management option is using scabicides. So that is 5% promethium cream applied to the whole body from scalp to soles uh, of the feet for 8 to 10 hours. And then you have to repeat that 8 to 10 days later in case any of the eggs have uh, since hatched. Then in addition to that, you also need to wash all your bed linens, towels, 
clothes and clean the house, so vacuuming, cleaning carpeted surfaces, those kind of things. Um, don't need to get fumigators or anything involved, just normal cleaning practices. Okay, so now we're on to the pediatric exam forms. As I mentioned before, if you've already done pediatrics, feel free to drop off here. Okay, so this uh, section is less vignettes and more um, just kind of a gallery of information. So we'll start with fifth disease or slap cheek or erythema infectiosa. It's caused by parvovirus B19 and the incubation period is 4 to 14 days. There's a low risk of transmission once the patient is symptomatic. Transmission usually happens through respiratory secretions or infected blood. The rash is this uniform erythematous macular papula lacy rash that begins 10 to 17 days after first onset of flu-like symptoms. The rash is over the cheeks, uh, on both cheeks, with circumoral sparing and may also affect the trunk and extremities. It's associated with 7 to 10 days of flu-like illness and fever. The rash may be warm, non-tender and pruritic, and the management is supportive. Um, in terms of outcomes, the rash fades over days to weeks, but may appear months later with sunlight exercise, and a complication of erythema infectiosum is aplastic crisis, which I'm not going to go into, but if you're interested, go ahead and read about it. So a differential for this, of course, is... domestic violence, um, and eczema with that cheek distribution. Okay, let's move on to hand, foot and mouth disease caused by Coxsackie group A virus. Uh, incubation period is three to five days and communicability is quite, quite likely after one to seven days of, after symptoms, but maybe up to months. Um, it's transmitted through direct and indi indirect contact with infected body fluids and also fecal oral. The rash is vesicles and pustules on an erythematous base. It has an apple distribution, meaning it's on the hands and feet, but may extend up the extremity. It's also associated with vesicles in the posterior oral cavity. Management is supportive and the main complication is dehydration. Moving on to measles, caused by morbillic virus. The incubation is 8 to 13 days, and communicability is 4 days before and after the rash. It's an airborne transmission. Um, the rash is an erythematous macular papular rash that starts 3 days after the start of flu-like symptoms. It starts at the hairline and spreads downward, sparing the palms and the soles. It's associated with the prodrome of cough, carizing, conjunctivitis, the three C's, um, copic spots, desquamation, desaturations, and a positive soro serology for measles IgM. It's also supportive management, um, and unimmunized contacts should get a measles, <laughs> a measles vaccine within 72 hours of exposure, or IgG within six days of exposure. So this requires respiratory isolation. Um, so that would be airborne precautions in the hospital. And of course, you have to report this to public health. Um, some, uh, one potential complication is a sec secondary bacterial infection. Um, so this second picture here, I hope you can see my mouse, is pointing out some coplic spots. If you can't see my mouse, I... Okay, moving on to roseola, caused by human herpes virus 6. Um, has an incubation of 5 to 15 days and is unknown about the communicability. The rash is blanching pink and macular papula and often appears once a fever subsides. It starts um, on the neck and the trunk and then spreads to the face and the extremities. It's associated with high-grade fever as well as irritability, anorexia, lymphadenopathy um, and erythematous tympanic membranes and pharynx. It's once again supportive management. Some complications include febrile seizures, aseptic meningitis, and thrombocytopenia. Next we have rubella, which is caused by rubivirus. Incubation is 14 to 21 days. 
Um, it's communicable seven days before and after the drug, the rash eruption. Um, transmission is droplet and the rash is pink and macular papilla and appears one to five days after the start of flu-like symptoms. It starts in the face and spreads to the neck and the trunk. It's associated with a prodrome of low-grade fever and occipital and retroauricular nodes. They'll have a positive serology for IgM rubella. You should advise caution to pregnant women um, when there's rubella involved because of congenital deformities, uh, including blindness. Rubella is treated with supportive management and it's also a, a, report, a mandatory report to public health. Okay, moving on to scarlet fever. Uh, it's classically a diffuse erythematous eruption, um, which is caused by a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction to the pyrogenic exotoxin produced by group A strep. Um, there's acute, acute onset of fever, sore throat, and a strawberry tongue. So that's one of those MCQ keywords, strawberry tongue. So 24 to 48 hours after pharyngitis, the rash begins in the groin, axilla, and neck, and the antecubital fossa. Within 24 hours, a sand paper rash becomes generalized with periol sparing, and it's non-pruritic, non-painful, and blanchable. The rash fades after three to four days, but may be followed by desquamation. Management is penicillin, amoxicillin, or erythromycin. Um, so just to say again, the key features in this one that pop up in MCQs are the strawberry tongue and the sandpaper rash. So one thing I would like to mention quickly is that um, ros roseola, rubella, scarlet fever, measles, it can be hard to just tell the rash apart by itself. So I'm really looking at all those different clinical features, um, including the prodrome for example, measles has the three C's, um, scarlet fever has the strawberry tongue, cruciola rubella, I guess the, the way to tell the most part is the way the rash spreads. So that's a bit, bit tricky. Okay, finally, we're on to varicella, um, caused by the varicella zoster virus with an incubation period up to three weeks. So it's communicable one to two days before the rash and five days after the rash. It's mainly airborne transmission, um, but of course can be through direct contact with vesicle fluid as well. So the rash is groups of skin lesions that are polymorphic, ranging from macules to papules to vesicles to crusts, um, and it's all over the body. It's associated with significant pruritus, and the management is supportive. It can be complicated by a bacterial superinfection and necrotizing fasciitis. Um, also, some severe complications include acute encephalitis and cerebellar ataxia. So, um, one of the key things with varicella that sets it apart from others is that it has uh, lesions at different stages throughout the cycle over the whole body. And of course, it's extremely itchy. All right, um, so just the last slide here is a useful list of reportable diseases that I found on the um, health government website. So um, ones that we talked about today include measles and rubella, um, but there's also some other ones there for your general information. Um, so I hope this talk was helpful and I would encourage you to use flashcards to study for dermatology with pictures um, and descriptions of the rash as well as associated features. All right, all the best with your exams. Thanks, bye.